Okay, sorry about that, folks. Uh, but thank you for tuning in to uh, the, the latest webinar today, uh, Analysis and Modeling Approaches for Trust Bridges. As, they, as uh, someone mentioned, my name is Daniel Baxter. I'm a senior bridge engineer with Michael Baker International out of uh, Baker's Minneapolis office. And uh, today, just uh, like to talk about analysis and modeling of trust bridges. Uh, I'll talk about, I, I think it's good just to start with a uh, basic definition of what is an idealized trust. Uh, then we'll talk for a little while about uh, bending moments and trust bridges, and which then flows into the topic, should a trust be modeled as pinned or fixed? This has uh, been a pretty, pretty big topic of discussion on a, on a few large projects I've worked on recently, so I think it's worth talking about that in some detail. Uh, then we'll talk about 2D versus 3D modeling and when each uh, type of modeling approach uh, you know, might be the, the best way to go. And then lastly, I'll conclude with a uh, case study of some uh, detailed 3D modeling we've done of the Winona trust bridge. And uh, thanks, thanks a lot for tuning in. So uh, well, let's just start by talking about what is an idealized trust. Uh, one uh, definition we're looking at is a, a trust is a structure composed of members joined together at their endpoints. The members are joined together by smooth pins, and all loadings are applied at the joints. That's a pretty important part of that. Um, and also, each trust member acts as an axial force member subject to either axial tension or compression. Uh, one, one thing is uh, often people think that each panel of a truss has to be a uh, triangle. That's in some definitions you'll see, but for, the more, for some compound trusses, that isn't necessarily the case. You can have a, uh, like a trapezoid there you see on the, uh, on the bottom right. So, but the key thing to keep in mind from this definition is, you know, the, the loadings are all applied, uh, applied at the joints in an idealized truss, and the, uh, the members themselves are joined together by smooth pins, and the members are in axial tension and compression. So let's look at the forces in an idealized truss. Here there we have a, it's a real simple three-member truss with a, a force of here applied at joint A. This is going to cause, uh, there will be axial tension in the diagonal in here and uh, axial compression in the uh, horizontal and vertical numbers for a load applied just at a joint there. So this this structure then an idealized truss and I should add that then the joints are joined together with smooth frictionless pins. We look at axial force, we're developing axial force following our definition of an idealized truss and there's no bending moment. And the force is applied at the joint. So we're able to you know, develop this axial force, no bending moment because the you know, force is applied at the joint. Connections are smooth frictionless pins. Now, uh, but what happens though when a load is applied away from the joint? Uh, now, if I apply a load away from the joint, the uh, this structure can't be in equilibrium and just carry axial force. I mean, axial force is, will still develop, but uh, bending moment will develop also, as you can see in the uh, right-hand figure on your screen there. And uh, so, the big thing here is if you if you start violating this definition, you apply a load away from a joint then you're not just going to have axial force in your truss members. You're also going to have to develop bending moments for the uh, structure to remain in, um, in structural equilibrium. And another way to think about this from a modeling perspective is if the load is applied at the location so that the model would be unstable, if you tried to model the whole thing with truss elements instead of beam elements, then uh, you do have, uh, you'll, if you can't model it and have it remain stable with truss elements and keep the actual geometry of where a load is applied, then you're going to have bending moment in your truss. Now, another question, you know, the second part, uh, another part of that uh, idealized truss definition was that the uh, you know truss members are joined together with smooth frictionless pins. But uh, another question is like, well, what happens if the joints are fixed? Here, for my idealized three-member truss, I'm, I'm still applying load at a joint, so I'm not, not violating the part of the truss definition of having a load applied at a joint, but instead of having smooth frictionless pins, the joints are fixed, uh, you know, rigidly fixed, and because of that, then uh, bending moments, as you'll see, uh, as you see in the, the right-hand figure there, will still develop in these truss members, although these bending moments aren't strictly required to, to uh, maintain force equilibrium, but because of the uh, 
the deformation is the curvature of the members with respect to one another that are created by these uh, by replacing a smooth rigid pin with a rigid connection, then these bending moments occur just by virtue of having the joints fixed rather than free to move in a pin. Now, which this brings us to, uh, I think it's good to talk about, to classify the types of bending moments we find in trusses into uh, you know, two terms which have, uh, which have been used for a long time in truss analysis, primary moments and secondary moments. So uh, here, sometimes these definitions uh, will vary. Some people define primary moment as any type of moment in trust, but uh, well, others use, use this definition here, which are that primary moments are bending moments that the trust members must develop to remain in structural equilibrium while carrying load. And um, so in this case, uh, that first case we saw, a load applied away from a joint will be a primary moment because uh, the trust needs to uh, uh, develop moment and to remain in structural equilibrium while carrying that load since it's not applied to the joint. And as is sometimes said, since the truss is loaded away from the work point of a joint, it is said to be eccentrically, eccentrically loaded. So primary moment, bending moment that a truss member must develop to remain in equilibrium or carrying load. Uh, so here are some common sources of primary moments in truss bridges. One of our uh, work lines of members that just due to the geometry of the actual bridge, particularly near connections, don't meet at a single point. Is shown in the uh, top right here. There's a, this is a joint of a truss bridge between a cantilever and suspended span, and you can see the work lines of the members shown in the white dashed lines don't meet at a single point, which actually induces a pretty significant moment. Another is that the centroid of uh, um, a, say, an asymmetric member doesn't coincide with the work line that creates a primary moment, or uh, as we saw in those. Uh, that a uh, simple idealized, uh, simple three member truss loads applied away from panel points will create a primary moment, as will member self weight. So, primary moment is any type of moment which is necessary for the truss to remain uh, to re maintain structural equilibrium, which will be caused by loads in some form not being applied right at a joint. Now, uh, secondary moments. These are a little different. These are bending moments in trust members that are not required to satisfy equilibrium. Uh, these are termed here as secondary moments or as, as they're sometimes called secondary stresses. Now, uh, it's important to uh, note that these are not the same as second order moments, which are caused by axial forces applied to compression members in their deflected position. Instead, uh, these uh, secondary moments, they're first order effects, but they are um, Say, but they're not required to maintain structural equilibrium under ultimate loads. So uh, we saw the primary moments were caused by applying load away from truss joints in some fashion. Secondary moments are caused by uh, like rigid connections between members. Like early truss bridges, the joints actually were true pins, but you know most heavier bridges, and particularly even ones that are you know, about 100 years old, will have a more you know, rigid connection with gusset plates. And this rigidity creates these secondary moments. Just to, here are some uh, illustrations from a, a book that was written about secondary moments uh, a little over 100 years ago that just shows uh, what this uh, effect is, that if you have rigid joints, as the truss deforms under load, the, um, those rigid joints you know, fix the uh, angle of the, the orientation of the members with respect to one another at the joints. And that creates uh, you know, this curvature here in members. And then since there's a direct relation between uh, moment and curvature, that creates a moment in the truss member, even though these moments are, you know, strictly speaking, required to and maintain structural equilibrium. This, you know, truss shown in this figure here, you can model it with truss elements. If the loads were all applied at the joints, then it would be in the equilibrium. But because of the joint rigidity, you get this curving of the members, which then creates a secondary moment. So uh, a, a big question is, well, should secondary moments be considered for truss analysis? Uh, bridge engineers have been debating this uh, question for, for over 100 years, really. Uh, one of the first major works about uh, you know, secondary moments and truss bridges was uh, by Grimm, published in uh, 1908, secondary stresses in bridge trusses. There are a lot of 
uh, you know, quite interesting to see, you know, longhand calculations um, or, you know, showing what the different effects, uh, different magnitudes of secondary stresses were. And he concludes, uh, kind of an ambiguous conclusion, uh, that, you know, in common cases, there is no necessity for these calculations, but there are, you know, some cases where uh, they should be examined, particularly if a bridge has to carry greater loads than those for which it has been designed. But he does suggest that, uh, you know, readers who take a particular interest in the subject should examine uh, trusses that, you know, they're working on and publish their results. So a little open-ended, not, not a real definitive answer from his work. Uh, probably the, you know, next major kind of advancement in how secondary stresses are treated in truss bridges uh, was for the uh, design of the Seattleville Bridge in 1916, which was uh, led by the, you know, the famous bridge engineer, Gustav Lindenthal. He's probably best known for uh, New York's Hellgate Bridge. And uh, young David Steinman was working on his team, and he you know, later became a you know, famous suspension bridge designer. I think the, the Mackinac Bridge between the lower and upper peninsula of Michigan may be one of his best known bridges, but that, that was Design, that was designed back in the uh, 1950s. So this was an early project of his. Uh, very, a very massive, uh, two-span, continuous, uh, double-track railroad bridge. And their uh, approach to handling secondary stresses, as uh, Lindenthal uh, explained in the uh, tra uh, in transactions of ASCE in the 1920s, was uh, to camber the trusses for full dead load plus one-half the live load but uh, assembling and erecting them so the angles between the members would correspond to the geometric form of the truss. So what they did here is they, uh, they've had the truss members fabricated at the cambered length, but then uh, assembled them and force fit them into the geometric uncambered length by having the connections, the holes drilled at the connections for the geometric uh, position of the truss. And this, uh, they noted, was the first bridge in which this method of reducing secondary stresses in all members has been used. And what this did is by, you know, force fitting these members with a cambered length into connections which had been designed for a geometric length, that created a reverse curvature in these members that then when the full dead load plus one half the live load was on, that induced a curvature in the opposite sense due to the deflections of the full dead load plus one half the live load, which then made a total moment or, you know, secondary stress or moment in these members equal to zero. And this is an approach which, you know, since this time has been used for many truss bridges. You have to uh, look at, take a careful look at the plan notes. It's not always dead load plus one half the live load. It may be just dead load or some portion of the live load in there. But uh, take a look at the plan notes. There's a good chance that this approach has been used. And uh, Lindenthal and Steinman were the first people to do this for all of the truss members. But that didn't settle the debate about whether secondary stresses were important or not. And uh, Parcel and Muir uh, undertook a, um, a pretty substantial amount of research and then published their uh, work in uh, 1934 in effect of secondary stresses on ultimate strength. Uh, they undertook a lot of gener uh, general analysis and laboratory tests. And they found that uh, you know, for most bridge members, the ultimate strength is practically unaffected even by high secondary stresses. And they found that it was evident that the secondary bending, these secondary stresses, were relieved by the plastic condition on the compressive face and a complete readjustment resulting in a nearly uniform distribution over the section was the final state of stress. So uh, in other words, here's just a sample uh, truss member modeled in some detail showing a, uh, you know, a stress gradient across the member which was caused by secondary uh, stress effects. So, the basic uh, idea here is that where you see these high stresses near the end of the member, what would happen is uh, this plastic flow, the member would start to yield, and as uh, the member yields, then this connection becomes less rigid, and then the, as a result of the connection becoming less rigid, then the, uh, second, the high secondary stresses tend to start to dissipate, and you get a more uniform distribution across the width of the member, uh, closely approximating the behavior of the, uh, the ideal trust member under just axial tension or compression. So, uh, their, you know, their conclusion was, for most cases, not all, they, they didn't say it was for every single case, but for most cases, the, the secondary stresses do not reduce the uh, ultimate strength of trust members. And that, that seemed to be taken as the final word on the subject until about, uh, I think, I don't know if people looked at this, but uh, some more recent work was done by uh, in 1986, where with general analysis of laboratory tests, where they were like, hey, no one's really looked at this since the uh, 
our cell study in detail, they wondered, do secondary stresses reduce the ultimate strength of trust members? Uh, if they, and uh, they actually found by, by doing their tests that continuity or fixity at the joints added actually 5% to 7% to the carrying capacity of the two trusses they analyzed. So here's a, uh, a graphic from their study, and uh, pardon me, I have a bit of a in stages of cold I'm fighting, but it takes a little takes a little looking at this graphic, I think, to get a sense of what's really going on here. So uh, uh, this computes uh, failure loads from their tests. The uh, the red vertical line here is tests with no eccentricity or no primary moment, so all the load being applied at the joints. The blue uh, points here represent the ultimate strength of pin-ended members, so all the load applied at the joint. Uh, so there's no eccentricity, no primary moment, and the joints are free to rotate. While the red data points represent both the same loads, but fixed end members, so the, uh, the trust members are not connected to the pins, but are rigidly fixed. And you can see here that the strength of the, uh, the fixed end members uh, for the same configurations was actually slightly higher than the strength of the pinned end members. But then as you move away from this vertical line, uh, the total failure load starts to decrease, and as you move to the left and right of this failure line, then you start to have eccentricity or a primary moment applied. So you can see that as their as primary moment increases, then the strength of the ultimate strength of the trust member starts to decrease quite substantially. So their finding here was that just having joint fixity actually added a little bit to strength, didn't decrease it, but primary moment definitely does decrease the strength. Of trust members. So, uh, and this, their findings and Purcell's findings are, uh, you know, reflected in current practice. LRFD, AFSCO LRFD in section four specifies that other than self weight and wind loads, uh, when loads are applied to trusses at panel points at the joints, trusses can be analyzed as an unconnected assembly. So, effectively, that's saying look at the primary moments from self weight, but secondary stresses can be ignored. And uh, in LRFD section 6.14.2.3 uh, notes that the stresses due to the dead load moment of the member shall be considered, as shall those caused by eccentricity of joints or working lines, but that secondary stresses uh, do not need to be considered in any member whose width measured parallel to the plane of distortion is less than one tenth of its length. So, in other words, for the majority of you know trust members, those whose you know width would be less than one tenth of its length, secondary stresses do not need to be considered which can be done by using a pin-connected analysis. And that's also reflected if you look in uh, the, six, the current sixth edition of the Guide to Stability Design, Metal Structures, note that secondary stresses have little effect on the buckling strength of trust members because of that local yielding of extreme fibers of members near the joints. These secondary stresses gradually dissipate as the truss is loaded to its ultimate strength, and that they therefore can be neglected Buckling analysis or the analysis of tension members. Uh, so that, that's a that's a you know fair amount of detail, but but again I've seen this question come up over and over, so I think I think it's worth going into this detail. Uh, so that you know now then brings us to the question: Should trusses be modeled as pinned or fixed? Where you model trusses as pinned, secondary moments are neglected, but if you model them as fixed, then secondary moments are included. Following a uh, you know, the YASHTO guidelines and all this research and the guide to stability design uh, for metal structures, then I recommend, you know, as long as your length of width ratio falls within that limit, that uh, trusses be analyzed as pin for the strength limit state in the plane of the truss. This is all in the plane of the truss, by the way. But uh, now this is, uh, this isn't YASHTO, this is just, you know, my opinion. I do feel that if you do a fatigue analysis, it's worthwhile uh, to fix the ends of the truss members because even though we know these secondary moments are not required to maintain equilibrium under ultimate loads. Uh, under service loads, I mean, these secondary moments are there, and if you're doing a fatigue analysis and looking at a repetitive, you know, stress range due to moving loads, I mean, those that, that stress range is really there due to the joint fixity. So that's my recommendation to look at, uh, you know, fatigue using fixed end analysis, but to keep pinned in for the strength limit states. But as we've seen, particularly in the research by Coral. Uh, including primary moment, I, primary moments in all limit states. So if a load is applied away from a joint, or uh, you know the work lines at a joint don't resolve because of you know, connection geometry, 
that should that shouldn't be resolved into a single joint that eccentricity needs to be included. Baker was analyzing a uh, trust in Cleveland, by the way, where uh, a previous consultant had, uh, had resolved everything into a single joint where um, the work lines didn't actually meet, and had concluded that uh, the trust had, trust had sufficient strength to, uh, you could actually wind it, but when uh, the effect of the primary moment from the geometry was considered, it actually didn't pass uh, its operating rating for that number. So uh, in inclusion, ignoring primary moments, not good and including them can uh, severely reduce the strength. So they, they really should be included uh, even though you can still um, you know, neglect secondary moments. Now, uh, if you do look at, uh, say, secondary moments for, for service or for some reason you, you do want to check what the magnitude is, as mentioned previously, that camber length adjustment process that was pioneered by uh, Lindenthal and uh, Steinman, you can actually model what the effect of that is by say assembling a truss in, so this is a screenshot of a Midas model in its geomet geometric position, and then shortening the members or lengthening them to have them get to their cambered lengths, and that effect, that will then induce this opposite moment in the members that uh, then will counteract the secondary stress. So in most cases, you know, you don't have to, you wouldn't have to do this, but if you are curious what the total, um, you know, stress effect is with secondary moments in, uh, Included, you can member a model that camber length adjustment process. Okay, so so that does it for you know the question of pinned or fixed uh, end conditions, but brings us to the uh, another question of just well, you know how complex should the model be? This is a screenshot of a 3D model of a truss. It's the Venona bridge that has some uh, you know shell element modeling and the connections integrated with it. But uh, I mean we don't have time to do this for for most truss bridges, so. Um, we want to you know, take the most efficient uh, route possible to get the information we're looking for. So, yeah, how complex should the model be? Well, uh, you know, I found in the experience of others at Baker that, uh, you know, for just conventional truss bridges for, you know, main member dead and live load axial forces, uh, 2D modeling uh, in, in the vast majority of cases uh, produces, you know, really reasonable conservative results and you know a 2D model for a truss would use the lever rule for live load distribution from the floor system just use you know tributary area for dead load but majority of cases for uh, you know main members 2D modeling it's a real good approach it's also a real efficient approach too so you can get a quick answer and if you're uh, you know analyzing an existing bridge you can you compare the forces you're getting to the plans it's a lot simpler than 3D modeling and is uh, appropriate in, in many cases. Now, um, when might, might you want to then do uh, go through the extra complexity doing 3D modeling? Well, I mean, there are I mean there are some good reasons to do it. If you're doing wind analysis, if you're looking at a floor system, often the forces I found in uh, floor systems will be uh, sometimes lar larger. Uh, if when the floor system is analyzed in 3D, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, also, uh, changes to the structural configuration of an original bridge. Let's say you're uh, analyzing a, a truss bridge where, you know, at some point in time, the intermediate deflection joints between uh, stringer bays uh, in the deck were, were closed and the deck was made, uh, say, continuous between units. Well, um, we found that that, that can cause, uh, you know, load to be shed, say, from the bottom cord into the uh, into the stringer and floor system, and, and those sort of effects are really best seen using a 3D model. So any type of change to a structural configuration of a truss bridge, uh, you know, static configuration from its original condition, might want to consider a 3D model to see what that's doing. And lastly, if there is some reason to do a detailed finite element analysis of a specific region of a truss bridge, like uh, specific connections, uh, integrating that uh, detailed finite element analysis into a 3D model is a good way to go. So uh, I think it's interesting to look at uh, how does the axial force in truss members vary? How do the results vary uh, between, say, 3D model, 2D model, original plan forces? Here's a, here's a graph that shows how the forces vary between a, a 3D model that Baker developed of the, the former Interbell Bridge in Cleveland versus a, a previous 2D rating and the original plan forces that were most likely also determined using. 2D analysis. So you can see there, I mean, there, there's some slight variations, but I mean, they're, they're really close for the most part. Uh, 
here's a here's another comparison for the Winona Bridge between uh, uh, Baker 2D and 3D models, a, uh, a 2D model developed by uh, our peer reviewer HMTV, and then the uh, original plan dead load axial forces. And again, this is for the top cord. You can see they're um, 2D versus 3D. I mean, I mean, there's some slight differences, but they're really they're really quite close. Nothing nothing too drastic. Uh, no change. No very you know, drastic changes in behavior between the 2D and 3D models. Uh, but we get to the bottom cord for the same bridge. We see the purple line here. This is uh, this is the 3D model. Well, these other lines are 2D models, and you can see there there is a real big difference here between what the the 3D model is coming up with for the bottom cord and what the 2D models are coming up with. And that's because for the, this bridge, this is a Winona bridge, by the way. There was a change in um, you know static configuration where um, intermediate joints. And the stringers were removed, so the stringers were able to carry axial force from end to end of the unit, and uh, they then you know started to act in parallel with the bottom cord since there was no there there were no intermediate joints, and then you know pulled load away from the bottom cord, which we see which we see in this graph. Now that that load then still needs to get transferred to the piers through the connections, so that that can raise the force in the floor beam connections. So you know that again there's a you know a change in static configuration. 3D models a real useful tool to be able to see what the effect of that change ends up being. Uh, you know, another uh, another good use of 3D models is particularly uh, wind analysis, particularly for new truss bridges that which might have uh, less uh, you know transverse top and uh, lateral bracing or and sway frames than has uh, you know have been traditionally used for through trusses. Here's an example. This is the new Milton Madison bridge between uh, linear results for moments, out of play moments in the end diagonals uh, due to wind and geometric nonlinear results. You can see the geometric nonlinear results. Uh, they're much, uh, they're much greater, and this is because this bridge has, uh, you know, let fewer sway frames than traditionally used. So a lot of that wind load force to get from the top cord. Down to the piers, all, a lot of that uh, force then goes through the end diagonal, and which is then in, you know transverse bending. And uh, the, looking at the ratio between the uh, you know the geometric nonlinear and linear results in these end diagonals, it's probably quite a bit higher than you get from just doing the approximate moment magnification procedure. So uh, you know 3D models modeling real real useful tool for wind loads, particularly for new truss bridges. And also for floor systems. So this is a this is an arch bridge, not a truss bridge shown here. This is the new Hastings bridge. But the floor system of tight arch bridge of uh, stringers and floor beams is typical for trusses too. And same uh, the same type of behavior occurs. When you model a floor system in 3D, you can often see the effect that uh, just due to differences in act, uh, longitudinal deformations between the uh, say the uh, in this case a tie girder or say a uh, Bottom cord in a through truss and the stringers will then will, will then cause a pretty um, pretty significant out of plane deformation of the floor beam to between the the cord or tie girder and the stringer lines. Where you know the stringers all have approximately the same you know longitudinal uh, deformations, but it's different than the cut tie girder or cord of the truss. Then you get this big, big out of plane displacement here in the floor beam, which can uh, you know that can lead to uh, fatigue issues and potentially strength issues. So, uh, looking if you if you do have a case like this, uh, looking at floor systems in 3D is something I would recommend. And you can sort of see how that happens with the Hastings bridge here. Is that you know the tie girder, it's a tension, it's not deforming as much as the floor system is. So the floor system has different deformations. It pulls the stringers forward and then causes the floor beam to have to bend out of plane between the exterior stringer and the tie girder. Uh, there are some, uh, you know, some cautions I think that should be used for 3D models. This, uh, this figure here probably you know, this might look like an abstract art of some kind, but it's actually a uh, axial force diagram from Midas of axial forces in bottom lateral bracing system and floor beams. And when uh, when these axial forces in the bottom lateral bracing are looked at from the side, you can see, you know, they uh, they, they increase for sort of in proportion to uh, what the you know forces in the cords would be. So here they increase in a positive moment region. There's a negative moment region, and you can see that uh, the you know 
bottom layer of bracing floor beams, this system will sometimes uh, supplement the uh, the cord that it's in parallel to, which will lower the which will lower the design forces in the cord when this happens. So you've got to be careful because if you uh, you if you use those lowered forces, then you in turn would want to design the bottom layer of bracing and all the you know, floor beams and all the connections for the, the higher forces that are being shed from the bottom cord. But I mean, there can be downsides for that because you don't usually want to consider the you know lateral bracing to be a primary member. So just be careful that this this type of behavior can happen in a 3D model, and you might want to consider sizing the main members based on the worst case results of a 2D model or a 3D model. So this if it works in 2D then you know you'll have sufficient strength that you won't have to worry about accounting for forces being shed into bracing at three, which would be the case if you only used a 3D model. Another thing uh, to consider for trust amount analysis when using a, uh, a 3D model is, you know, carefully think about what is the ability of the actual uh, connections to the transfer moments and other other types of structural actions in a 3D model. I, sometimes I think that the tendency of folks will be to use you know fully fixed connections without releases everywhere in a 3D model, but it, it's it's worth paying pretty close attention to what the act uh, what the actual uh, connection what forces the actual connection can transmit. So here's a here's a sample connection of a uh, floor beam. To a bottom cord, there's a. It's a little hard to see from this figure, but uh, th there is a direct connection between the bottom flange and a, a sort of lower lateral bracing connection plate. But there's no connection to the top flange, so this is basically just a uh, is basically just a simple shear connection, which uh, can just basically transmit shear into the uh, into the bottom cord since there's no. Uh, there's no top flange connection. This this connection can't uh, I mean can't generate a substantial force can't transfer a substantial force couple across itself of any um, you know substantial magnitude. So it's not it's not fixed for moment. And uh, you know since there's no way to you know transfer a force couple, it's not fixed for torsion either. And if you did fix it for those uh, force actions, that might actually that it can't really carry. That might actually you know, change the way some of that force is being carried from, say, just shear and in-play moment in the floor beam into uh, shift to some of that into torsion or, you know, continuous bending in a floor beam, which, so that, that could actually end up underestimating maximum in-play bending and estimating maximum in-play uh, in bending in the middle of the floor beam and maximum shear at the end of the floor beam. So just, just pay real close attention to what the actual configurations of truss bridge connections are if you're modeling them 3D. Now, as I mentioned earlier, there's some cases, uh, they, they don't crop up all the time, but there, there's some cases where I've, I've found in truss bridge analysis where, you know, there are questions of like what is happening in detail at a connection or with gusset plates, maybe there's some uh, out of plane deformation of the gusset plate, and you're wondering what the uh, effect of this is on the gusset plate, or you know some other type of question, which is best solved by creating some type of detailed shell element model of a of a connection of a truss bridge or of several members. Now, if that if that member just if that shell element model just you know stood alone in space, it could be difficult to determine like what the proper boundary conditions for that model. Should uh, should really be uh, so. I, I found that a, a nice way to not worry about those boundary conditions so much and have a freestanding mo model from having a straight freestanding model and to like look at the behavior of the uh, region in a whole is to then integrate this detailed modeling into a 3D model of uh, of a truss. And I'll just uh, basically conclude the presentation by just showing a case study of some detailed modeling that we have ongoing for the rehabilitation of the Winona Bridge in Winona, Minnesota. It's a, a, a truss bridge built in uh, 1940, crosses the Mississippi River, uh, and what we're looking to do is to provide internal redundancy in the tension members. The uh, idea we're studying is to uh, add high strength bars through the inside of the member so that if uh, one of like the two channels of the existing steel would uh, fracture, then these uh, 
high strength bars would provide internal redundancy. Uh, but that's, uh, uh, you know, that's uh, raised several questions. So uh, to get a better sense of what the, you know, be, this behavior would be, we, we picked one of the tension diagonals, in this case U13, L14, that uh, had some of the highest forces and um, did a, a detailed model of member U13, L14 and its adjacent connections and elements with shell elements in that and then uh, integrated that into our existing 3D model of uh, high strength bars that uh, go through the inside of uh, U13 L14 were modeled with truss elements and uh, the rivets in each connection were modeled with a connection of beam elements and multilinear links and we did this analysis in MIDAS uh, 2015. So here's a here's a more close up of the portion of the 3D model in which this uh, modeling has been integrated we uh, to to do this shell element modeling, we um, you know we worked really closely with the shop drawings. Uh, you know, made some CAD drawings from based on the original shop drawings to determine where uh, key nodes should be, such as uh, you know corners of the gusset plates or where the rivets are located, and then uh, use the information from these drawings to then come up with uh, you know key node locations in Midas. This was developed in space, like a way in you know the space of the model. These, you know, key nodes were then defined and imported into Midas in, uh, away from the uh, model itself. Uh, then, you know, we connected the, the shell elements between them, then used the auto-meshing features of Midas to uh, make intermediate nodes. And then once this detailed modeling was complete, we uh, deleted the uh, existing, uh, existing beam elements in this 3D model that this detailed modeling would replace, and then translated everything over for the two uh, to the 3D model and connected the ends of the detailed modeling re region to the existing truss with uh, rigid link type connections. And a uh, young engineer in our uh, Minneapolis office here, uh, Sophia Perto, did most of this work. So uh, we, we did, we, we undertook this detailed study to, uh, you know, there were some questions we wanted to answer. Um, what are what happens in the adjacent members after one channel fractures? Because the, these high strength bars, you know, they can take up the axial force, but they, they have less unaplane bending stiffness. So how, what happens when that load is shed? And we also wonder that you know the high strength bars, they're going to have their areas smaller than the existing steel, which is you know, A7 steel, 33 ksi strength versus a 150 ksi bar. So we wondered would there be large differential displacements? between the end of the member and the existing steel to connection. And if there were large differential displacements between the bottom end of the member and the connection, would that cause uh, the rivets and the gusset plates to fail due to large displacement? And lastly, one of our questions is, was, will the high strength bars engage to carry load after one channel fractures and what percentage of the load in the remaining uh, member will they carry? So. Uh, to answer these questions, we, we really did need to uh, undertake this type of detailed modeling and look at it from a uh, material nonlinear point of view. And I found that, say, aside from you know, detailed seismic analysis, there, there really aren't that many occasions where, particularly in the analysis of a new bridge or an existing bridge, you really need to do a material nonlinear analysis of some type. But this, this was one of them. So we considered three analysis conditions. Uh, one is for our, you know, our extreme three, which you know represents the uh, fracturing one of the channels. We wanted to see what the forces were with both channels of this member in place, because you know, the U13 L14 is composed of two channel sections joined together with batten plates. So we looked at that before fracture. Uh, with, then uh, after one channel has fractured, shown here, and then after both channels have fractured, just to see what would happen if the high strength bars were carrying all of the load. So uh, to, to do this, we needed to uh, we needed to incorporate material nonlinear nonlinearity into some regions of this model. We wanted to get the uh, multilinear behavior of uh, rivets included. So uh, for A141 rivets, uh, looked up a uh, there's some research that that was done on rivets uh, in the 1950s to determine this uh, deformation versus shear curve that we were then able to, that which we then incorporated. Uh, so we incorporated that deformation versus shear curve into the MIDAS uh, multilinear 
elastic link, which then we use to uh, model the rivets uh, between the uh, you know between the uh, member and the gusset plate. Uh, those are in parallel with uh, you know, small beam elements, which have uh, zero stiffness for shear in this direction, but stiffness in the other direction. So then the total force can be found by combining the stating the resultant of the shear in the other directions, plus the resultant of the shear in the longitudinal direction from the multilinear link. And for the case with one channel fractured, then we also wanted to make sure that the or that the stress in the remain channel would not go above the stress it could carry. Uh, it, could, it would not go above the yield stress. Again, we used a, another multilinear link as sort of an axial stiffness spring where once the uh, uh, force reaches a point that would cause yielding, that it is you know, perfectly plastic, perfectly free to deform, that was placed in parallel with a uh, beam element with zero stiffness in the axial direction to force all axial force to go through this multilinear link. And uh, we, we tune the point at uh, which the link would become plastic so that the, uh, the effective stress, the von Mises stress, didn't exceed the yield stress because this, uh, this beam element is zero axial stiffness, but it will be able to carry bending moment in the in-plane and out-of-plane direction, out direction, which then contributes to the total uh, you know, effective stress in the member. So we lowered this, uh, the point at which this became plastic until we were able to get the uh, stress not to exceed the yield stress. So uh, here, here's a look at our results. We found, we saw that you know things were behaving as intended before one of the channels fractured for the state before the channel fractured. We used a uh, we used a minus function of determining a uh, equivalent static force for lag load analysis for all this analysis because since this is a nonlinear analysis, you need to use uh, you know you need to create an equivalent static load case so you can't uh, you can't analyzes for all of the different moving nodes. So we did that for all three conditions, found you know, stresses in the normal range, um, saw that before fracture, you know, the high strength bars were carrying some force, not that much. Uh, here's a look at the ma maximum rivet shear before fracture, didn't reach the point of uh, about 22 kips where then the rivets become a lot more plastic. And uh, so that, that was expected. Then uh, we looked at the case with one channel fractured. You can see here that, uh, as expected, this the outer channel here that we're seeing, that's the side that fractures. So the, the stress, this is, uh, you know, we're looking at von Mises effective stress here uh, near the fracture goes to about zero, and then the, some stress goes through the batten plates, and it's not zero, zero at the bottom. Then at the interface, uh, this is set to like dark red is the, the yield stress. There's a, there's a little artifact of just the connection with the uh, uh, multilinear link right here, but uh, away from just the, from the connection, you can see we've reached the yield stress in the, uh, the remaining channel, and then that, that stress stays high all the way down to L14 near the bottom of the channel. Uh, the high strength bars do engage as we would expect they would, the, the force in them increases after fracture, and uh, if we look at the axial force distribution after fracture between the high strength bars and the remaining channel and look at what percent of the total force that is versus percent total area, we can see that the force is being distributed between the high strength bars and the remaining channel basically in uh, proportion to uh, total axial demand. So that, that made us feel good that the uh, you know, forces were being distributed between high strength by the high strength bars and the channel as uh, we had assumed they would be. Uh, looking at deformations after fracture, this was uh, of one channel. This was the best news, and that we saw that uh, you know deformations increased gradually from top uh, U13 up here to L14 at the bottom. There was no uh, large difference in deformations between, say, the bottom of this member and the gusset plate, which could potentially cause the rivets to tear out. Uh, we saw this was a, this, these are exaggerated deformations. It was interesting to see that. The, the fractured channel starting to peel away a little as we predicted it would while the, the remaining channel remained rigid. And then looking at the uh, maximum rivet shear in the connection with the remaining channel that didn't fracture, it got up to uh, it, its you know max, maximum value of 21.9 kips right before the uh, rivet would become more plastic, but didn't didn't get really any near the type of deformation you'd need sort of around the 0 0.2 
in trains to uh, to break the rivet, to shear the rivet, so um, everything seemed fine. There's the rivets there, and uh, looking at the differential displacement between uh, U13 and L14, it increases a little after fracture just because there's a losing one of the channels. It's less stiff, but uh, nothing drastic. And even with the high strength bars in place only, you get a, a three inch difference, but still not, uh, you know, nothing, it's not that bad. And the, uh, you know, force on the high strength bars, the bars engage as uh, we thought they would. And it's interesting to think about this in uh, terms of strain, because if we look at the, uh, this, this, you know, the strain from the strain compatibility to the strain in the bars has to be the same as the strain in the uh, the, the channels. And uh, you know, after fracture, we're at a longitudinal strain of 0.001. If the bars were in place and only, we'd be at a longitudinal strain of 0.003, which is close to you know the sort of maximum strain you'd want to get out of those bars. But if you look at a stress strain curve for uh, A7 steel, the uh, the you know plastic behavior begins at a, a strain for the A7 steel that these bars are in parallel with the strain of 0.001. This is a linear scale, so if we're at 0, 0.002, 0, 0.003, we're we're just really near the beginning of the plastic range of the existing steel. So uh, not anywhere near not anywhere near uh, rupture, just very very close to the beginning of the plastic range there. And uh, again, just looking at this. Shear versus deformation for the rivets. Uh, we satisfied ourselves. Uh, we were able to see that the uh, you know the rivet displacements were not um, not overly large. The rivets were going to shear off. So uh, th there are some. I think this was a this was an occasion where this type of you know detailed 3D analysis of a truss was uh, definitely worthwhile to look at the effects of internal redundancy and what happens when part, a portion of a member does fracture. Uh, we were able to, you know, we were able to do that uh, using using the Midas Advance package, uh, looking at uh, looking at the bridge in 3D, and you know our conclusions as a result of doing this analysis, where the force of the adjacent members does go up a little bit, but uh, not not much of a just about a five percent increase in demand capacity. There were no signs of connection distress. Rivets didn't shear off. Uh, the high strength bars did engage after fracture in proportion to their total steel area and uh, the strains of the remaining steel, existing steel, remain near the beginning of the plastic range after fracture and um, the strains of the remaining channel would, wouldn't go ahead, couldn't be larger than the maximum high strength bar strain, which was, as we saw in the A7 stress strain for right near the beginning of the plastic range. So, just just wanted to just wanted to show everyone an example of where you know detailed modeling and 3D of trust bridges can be used to uh, solve uh, get get some results that would be you know I think pretty pretty difficult to come up with anyways but this does uh, bring bring us to the the conclusion um, of the talk and uh, just just to go over some of the some of the points some of the points I talked about vast majority of cases, you know, pin, using pin truss ends for the strength limit state are the way to go. And, you know, we saw why that is that, you know, 100 years of research and it's been done over 100 years does show that even though uh, elements do develop due to the fixity of truss members as you get near the ultimate strength, local yielding plastic flow relieves that fixity and is not, you know, need and relieves that fixity. So those moments didn't go away and also they may be less than you think they are due to that uh, cambering, uh, member cambering length uh, procedure. Uh, we did see that uh, should always consider primary moments of truss bridges, say due to you know load applied away from a joint. If you have a deck truss that you know, the top cord is uh, continuous or you composite with the deck, that's going to uh, induce uh, primary moment. In any case where load is applied away from a joint or work lines don't meet in a single point, that will create a moment those moments we've seen do have a real effect in decreasing ultimate strength, and they should be considered. And we've also we've seen a 2D analysis sufficient for the main members of most truss bridges, but there are cases I think where 3D is a good call. So we talked about you know wind load analysis, looking at floor systems. If uh, a bridge has changed its static configuration, since if, if there's been some change to the boundary conditions, the static configuration of a bridge since it was designed. Uh, 
also talked about it. It's, it's just really important to be consistent with analysis and design if you are using a 3D model. If you use uh, design forces from a 3D model for the main members and 3D is all you're considering, watch out because the uh, force could have been shed into the secondary bracing members from the main members. So then you have a choice and you either need to design the secondary bracing members for those higher loads than you'd otherwise design for or maybe you'd want to also use a 2D model and just pick the greatest force between 2D and 3D so you can be sure you're not relying on secondary bracing members to carry load. But do you know do consider that you know doing a detailed integrated model of you know shell element modeling in a 3D beam element otherwise beam element model of the truss is a useful tool I think to have and something you can you can do relatively easily using 